Greetings and welcome to the Welsh American Channel. Today we are pleased to have Welsh author Rush Williams as our guest. If you ask most Americans which ethnic people in Britain are the greatest storytellers, many might say Ireland with the leprechauns or the little people. Others might say Scotland with the Loch Ness Monster. However, there is a third Celtic nation in the Isles that has a rich collection of folk stories. And this, of course, is Cymru, known to most of us Yanks as Wales. So today, we're going to be talking to Russ and exploring his new book, Where the Folk, published by Callan Publishing. Now, I checked this out, and I don't yet have a link for you for Amazon, because this is an advanced copy of his book, which is just now being released. But it is entitled Where the Folk. And as the back cover opines, I thought this was really good, quote, as entertaining as it is informative, where the folk follows Russ Williams as he travels in Griff, his creaky red fiesta in search of places associated with Wales legends, folklore, and urban myths. In this humorous travelogue, not only does Russ recount some of Wales' most exciting stories, he also explores the origins behind the myth, talking to experts and storytellers to find out how and why they might have come about and what they can tell us about Wales past and present, end of quote. So with that introduction, I'd like to welcome you, Russ, to the Welsh American Channel. Hello, Greg. Uh, thanks for having me. Pleasure's all mine. And it's very nice to hear you refer to uh, Wales as Cymru first, I must say. It's uh, a lot of people over here are reviving the Welsh names for places now. Sure. So, yeah, it's good to hear it happening on the other side of the pond. Well, I think that's kind of um, happening globally here in the United States, out mm. in the western parts of the United States a lot of mountains and so on that originally had Indian names, but were renamed after the white settlers came in, are mm. now being are being restored to their original ancient names. Yeah, so that may be right. something that's happening uh, in various areas of the yes, world. And, so it, and it's the great. Thing, and I must it? say, you know, I, I, do, I don't like to use the word revive because as you just pointed out for us Welsh speakers, it's always mm -hmm. been Cymru. So yeah, it is it is mm -hmm. nice to see it happening on an international uh yes. scale. Yeah, absolutely. So Russ, can you give us a biography of your life? How long you've had an interest in writing and how writing became part of your life? Yes, so uh, so I grew up in Caernarfon, up in North Wales, uh, just on the outskirts of the Snowdonia National Park. Or, although I should say Eruri now, because that's another mm -hmm. one of the parks. Right. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so Caernarfon is a predominantly Welsh-speaking town. Um, you'll be very lucky to hear any English outside of uh, the the tourist season, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even a lot of fellow Brits are surprised to learn that there are there are British people who, whose la first language isn't English. Um, and, you know, gosh, I remember learning English when I was about f five or six years old, you know, and getting English words wrong. Um, so, yeah, so we gr grew up in Kainarwan, and although everyone speaks Welsh, we do, of course, have access to English media so from a very young age i i enjoyed you know loved reading mm -hmm. uh, and typical little boy i loved reading about monsters and dragons and what have you and i never grew out grew up out from that really um and then one of my favorite books you know both series rather was rl stein's goosebumps Books. And I remember when I was, you know, a little boy, I would write little goosebump esque books of my own and, you know, wow. design a cover and I'd staple it together. And my grandmother, when she would babysit, would always have a read and she always said, Oh, he'll be an author one day. Oh, look um, at that. But yeah, it's great. That's finally come, come true <laughs> after many years. I'm 35 now. Mm -hmm. Got my debut book coming out this year. Um, and then, 
when I was young, I was a p member of a, a national writing group for children uh, called Squad Squenny in Welsh, which is the writing squad in English. Um, and I was selected. I think there were, there were about 20 of us. So every primary school uh, children in Wales, they wrote to short stories and the 20 of the best were selected to be members of this national group. So I was very lucky to be a part of that. Uh, and I got a lot of great advice from various authors being a member of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I eventually moved, went to university down in Cardiff and found myself speaking English on a daily basis for the first time in my life. And it, it was there I developed this hybrid accent of mine, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in a folk festival this weekend and there was an English lady there who pointed out my accent and she said, you've, you've got the harsh anger of the northerner mixed with the, the, the melodic softness of a southerner, as she uh, described it, uh, <laughs> which I thought was great. Yeah, that uh, is great. Uh, of course, you know, in, in uni I had other things on my mind other than writing, which I won't get into here, mm -hmm. but a few years passed and then I went off to Australia for a couple of years. Oh, and wow. Very lucky. I had an internship with the, Her the Herald Sun in Melbourne. Uh, although, you know, at that time, I thought I'd really, you know, write, writing was my passion. I wanted to be a journalist, but very quickly realised journalism w wasn't for me. Uh, I've, after a couple of years, I moved back to Wales, moved back down to Cardiff. And for many years, you know, writing was just a hobby for me, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, And for the most part, I worked with teenagers in, in a care setting for many years. Uh, one of the, the most popular blogs I had a few years ago, um, I forgot to mention, I've got an autistic brother. Uh, so I wrote a blog about what it's like growing up with an autistic mm -hmm. brother. And that proved very popular. So it kind of reignited my interest in writing and, and more so to get my writing read by other people. Sure. Uh, and then which brings us to, to this book, which all came about during lockdown. Yeah. Well, it's a great question. What Tell us what happened during the pandemic that inspired you to write the book. Well, uh, there's a few things, really. So, you know, as you know, we were all under, you know, in lockdown. We couldn't travel very far. Mm -hmm. And I do, I, you know, I've always enjoyed hiking, um, you know, for the, for the first time in my life. I, I, in this situation where I couldn't go very far. I had like mm -hmm. a five mile limit, then a ten mile limit, so I found myself thinking, right, where where can I go? And at the time, I was reading up a lot on the Mabinogion, the the old the Welsh the classic Welsh legends, if you will. Okay. Um, and when I was talking to my friends, a lot of them they almost had a sense of shame when they told me that they didn't really uh, know many of the tales, mm -hmm. and a lot of them said. I'm Welsh. I should know this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I kind of thought to myself, right, well, I'll I'll start visiting places where these tales and not just the Mabinogion, but Welsh folk tales in general. And I started visiting the locations where these tales took place. Uh, and I started writing a blog where the folk, uh, in order to, what I thought at the time, educate the masses, but... As I told told you in our previous conversation, Greg, mm -hmm. I have quickly realized that I had a lot to learn myself. <laughs> you know? Sure. We all uh, so and I learned so much about Wales and you know Welsh culture. So and it, it was marvelous, I must say. Uh and I but I found myself going down so, something of a, a folklore rabbit hole, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and I started asking myself, well. Where did these tales come from in the first place? Who came up with these? And, uh, you know, what do they mean? You know, is there any kind of moral mm -hmm. kind of, you know, reason behind all of them? So I started approaching historians and folklorists uh, and began having interviews. And I learned a great deal, a great deal, I must say. And uh, eventually I, I thought, oh, well, 
there's a few people reading the blog. It's not just my mum mm-hmm. <laughs> giving me a like on social media sure. anymore. Right, sure. So I thought, right, well, if there's an audience, maybe this could be a book. So I sent out a few emails then to some publishers and Calon, uh, which are owned by the University of Wales Press. They got back to me and agreed, yes, this this could sell. But the trouble is, Greg, as you probably know, most authors approach publishers when they already have a book to mm-hmm. hand out. And at that point, I didn't have a book. Okay, uh, yeah. I, I, and with lockdown restrictions, I hadn't gone much further than Cardiff at that point. So uh, so there I was. I had a year then to uh, to write this book, to hand in to them, and, of course, to visit other locations. And I was very lucky we didn't have a, a you know a second wave of, of COVID, if oh. you will. So, so off I went That's for my for adventure. Sure. <clears throat> yes. So to give a brief outline of the book without giving away too much detail. Beginning in Cardiff, you travel to 32 exciting locations to explore the local folklore and myths of each location that each location holds. So where is the location of your final stop or the end of your journey? Well, I I thought it would, you know, that Callan, when they got back to me, they said, yes, we'd like this book, but they told me you need, we want a fairly equal, you know, good coverage of, of Wales. Mm-hmm. So I knew I had to go, you know, on from south to the north. And I thought, well, what better place to end than in my hometown? So that's the journey I took. So, so the first few trips, due to the restrictions, were mainly day trips from Cardiff to surrounding mm-hmm. locations. And then as soon as I was given the, the green light to go further afield, uh, I set off to to the west, first of all. So I went from Cardiff along the southern coast into Pembrokeshire and then up through Cardigan along the coast. And uh, and my girlfriend, my partner, Sophie, she joined me for that, that part. So that was a mm-hmm. nice little holiday for us as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then... Up I went then up north through Snowdonia before eventually ending up in my hometown, as I as I just mentioned. Although I do say that it, the journey was meant to end in my hometown, but then I realized, well, Anglesey, just off the coast, you know, that that's you know full that's got loads of folk tales in itself, and a very sure. important one, the location of you got Ennis Candwin up there which is the, the home of Santa's Dwynwen, the Welsh, uh, the patron saint of love. So I thought, well, I can't miss that out. So I did cheat slightly. So technically, mm. the story ends on Anglesey. All right. Well, you're the author. You get those privileges. So that's, <laughs> that's okay. Right. <laughs> so how long did it take you to travel to all 32 locations a year or more? Or how much time did it take you to do all that traveling? Well, it did. Um, as I mentioned, you know, when I started off, I was still working, so I could only pop out on the weekends. So, mm-hmm. so naturally, it took me a few months to do uh, the the southern kind of the southern locations. Uh, and then when I went off with my partner to the west, we we had a, booked a, a cottage and we were there for a week, which we used as a base. And my family. Uh, still live up north, so I was very lucky. I could use their home as a base. So the north was a combination, really. I did go up there for a, a week, following mm-hmm. covering the west. But there were a lot of locations I, you know, slipped in whenever I went up to visit family as well. So you are right; it probably did take, you know, best good part of a year, say, to do to do everywhere. But that is no reflection on Wales. Greg, I must say, mm-hmm. Wales isn't, you know, is very well known. Wales isn't a very big place. So I would say if anyone would like to go on a, a Welsh folklore road trip of their own, mm-hmm. you could easily book a couple of weeks, say, you know, to take it in your stride. You can't visit everywhere in a couple of weeks, of course, but you could certainly get a good coverage in, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So when your traveling is done, and you've gathered all the materials from your journey, and now you must sit down and write your first draft of the book. 
you know, if people are waiting for it, right? How long did it take you to complete all the writings and gatherings of those materials to create the first draft of your book? Well, yeah, so the the, the first draft, you know, I, I read, mm-hmm. you know, I've read so many articles by authors over the years. And, and as I mentioned, I was a member of the, the writers group there, so I had a lot of advice. And most authors will tell you, look, the first draft, don't think too much, <laughs> just get it down, you mm-hmm. know, get the words down, say what you want to say. And one of the best, you know, trick, do not edit as you go along. Because I, I don't think the first draft will ever fit, you know, get done if you go about it mm-hmm. that way. So I did. So I, as soon as I got the book deal, I stopped writing the blog, concentrated on the book. And of course, I could only write so much without having actually been to these locations. So there were a lot of gaps in between, I must say. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, organizing uh, interviews with people as well. So I had so very often I, I would have already finished a chapter, but then I'd have an interview to slip in then. So I would go back to it. Uh, but so. Due to locate, you know, the traveling and the interviews, it probably did take me a year to write the full draft. But I, you know, I think if if I was writing fiction, you know, and didn't mm-hmm. have to go anywhere, I think I would have done a much quicker. I think. But Greg, I must say that's just the first draft. <laughs> you yeah. know, I think I, mean, I, I lost count. Yeah, yeah, sure, I lost I count how many drafts I did. You know, since then. I I think probably about six or seven draft, you know, before I actually handed it in to the publishers, and even then, you know, they would send it back saying, "Oh, yeah, it was great, but can you cut this interview in half, or can we have a bit more on this?" Uh, so it's you know, the book's out next month, and it's only a few weeks ago that I actually stopped editing it, really. So it's mm-hmm. been a very long process, really, since twenty, you know, twenty twenty one. We're at twenty twenty four now, so yeah, it's been a long process. And sure. people keep asking me, Are, you know, have you got another book on the go? And I think, yeah. you know, I've been concentrating so much on this one. Sure. I don't have much time yeah, for other projects. Right. So it's been great. It's been a wonderful journey, but I'm very much looking forward to beginning new projects now, and. Uh, I must say, I might give a fiction a go because <laughs> it's, hey, it's very, you go. yeah, I enjoyed yeah. writing nonfiction, but it's, I think one of the biggest stresses, you know, when, when the release date is looming is ensuring that you've got all your facts right. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, that would be so awful if the book came out and, you know, I'm sure every author would say that they would edit their books, you know, for it, for eternity as, I'm sure if you leave a book for you know a couple of months, then read it back, and you say, "Oh gosh, what what was I trying to say there?" So I think I could edit it for the rest of my life. I think so. There has has to come a point where I leave it be, mm-hmm. and fingers crossed, I, I <laughs> I've got all my historical dates correct. So, Great. but I think I think we're good to go. <laughs> awesome. There's an old story about Mark Twain uh, that he said that you never really finish writing a book. He says, eventually, the publisher shows up, rips it out of your hands and says, you're done. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we, I think people who write are kind of like perfectionists. They're editing, re-editing, 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 because they do want everything to flow and everything to be technically correct. And that that's a very high bar for any author. Oh, gosh, that's right. And, you know, another tip, you know, many authors gave me was, as soon as you've written your first draft, don't even look at it. Don't think about it. Just let it sit for a good month or so. Hmm. And then go back to it with fresh eyes. Uh, and, and you're quite right. You go back and you say, God, what, what was I trying to say? <laughs> there? You know. So I think at the time, your brain knows what you're trying to say. So it doesn't pick up on or mistakes, or like you said, if things don't flow well, you know, right. so it's sure. always good. Let it, let it rest. And I saw another a quote, good quote on Facebook today. Uh, said, you know, one of the biggest challenges of being an author is 
you want your book read by everyone apart from people you know. And that's what, mm -hmm. one of my biggest fears is the feedback from, you know, friends and family. Which I'm sure they'll all say, oh, we loved it. But 100%, you know, they, they might, you know, the, the scariest audience, I think, for mm -hmm. any author. Sure, absolutely. Well, as a Welsh American, there actually is one story in your book that I've heard of before because it's still practiced by a few Welsh Americans today. We've kind of distorted it a little bit. We've made a luncheon out of it. Uh, we, we've probably uh, removed from it some of its Welsh roots, but it's the, the Mari Lwyd or Vari Lwyd uh, custom. And I think you cover this in your ninth stop. So can you give us a little bit more background about this unique custom, actually one of the few in your book that is still practiced in areas yeah. of the United States today? Yes, well, that's, you know, funnily enough, it was one of the customs I myself was, you know, totally new to because mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a southern, very much a southern tradition here in Wales. I think, I think it started in, in Glamorgan, uh, and you know I think it was ad adopted by Pembrokeshire and other southern uh, counties, uh, but it's never never really kicked off up north. I must say. So growing up in mm -hmm. in Carnarvon, you know pro probably the most Welsh place in, in the world, and I and I can't recall ever you know being told about the Mary Lloyd. So so it was all very new to me and. I think there was a big folk revival in the 70s and the 80s. And little folk folk clubs down south started mm -hmm. to revive the tradition down here. And again, social media then also uh, popularised it even further uh, in the noughties and, well, the last couple of decades, really. And I saw, I remember just before I started writing the blog, there was this post on Facebook saying... Can you believe there's a, a country where there's a Christmas tradition where people dress up as a dead horse and go around challenging people to a Welsh rap battles? <laughs> you know? And I was thinking, wow, what on earth is this? So, and that, you know, that's a very yeah, humorous way to put it. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a, it's an old wassailing folk custom i think i think it began around the 19th century i think you know the, the victorians a lot of stuff came about with the victorians uh, I think, you know around then was the when mabinogion mm -hmm. was first translated into english and there was this huge surge of interest in british mythology as you mentioned you mentioned the irish and scottish mythology beforehand and so around the same time welsh mythology kind of became popular uh, and one of the traditions that came about with that was the Mary Lloyd. So, in essence, what happens is it tends to happen between Christmas and New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. So, a group, what, what happens is a group of people go out. So, you won't just have Mary, which is, and Mary, Mary's the name of the horse, by the way. So, you, it won't just be Mary. There's a band of people, uh, and many of them will come dressed as stock characters and they'll have instruments with them and they'll go dancing and singing down, down the streets and they'll knock on people's doors and they'll challenge the people inside the homes to a punko, which is a, a Welsh battle of rhymes. And what happens is, so the people on the other side of the door will have to you know, exchange exchange rhymes, and if mm -hmm. they if they lose, then Mary Lloyd and her gang gain access to the house, and they they get to help themselves to some of their beer and so some of the the many treats they have stocked up over the the festive period, and then they move on to the next house. And I'm sure it's a very fun and cheap night <laughs> for Mary Lloyd and her gang, mm -hmm. and. So when I was writing the book, I met up with two lovely ladies, uh, Pat and Anne, from the Chantrissant Folk Club. And they revived the tradition back in the 80s, and they're still still going strong today. And they and I sat down with them, had a cup of tea, and they told me all about the tradition. 
uh, and I, what they suggested to me that it certainly started in their area back in the day it was a way for the the you know the poorer locals if you will who didn't have much food and beer stocked up in their houses and it was a great way for them to have a, a you know and have a good time at the end of the year as well. And even if the people on the inside of the house would win, you know, the pub call, very mm-hmm. often they would still be invited in for a beer. So sure. so there sure. was, you know, there was a, somewhat of a, a logical reasoning behind it, if you will. Yeah. So, but, but these days, they don't go around houses so much. They tend to target the local pubs, the taverns these days, and they tend to collect money for charity rather than, you know, take okay. people's yeah. beers off them. <laughs> Although they do jokingly try to steal people's beers. And, you know, th- those who aren't uh, familiar with the cu- with the custom, some of them can get quite upset at times, <laughs> as you can imagine. Dead For horse sure. comes into the pub and tries taking your beer. So they don't do that as much. So it's all in the name of charity these days. But, but they do also... Uh, have events where Mary Lloyds from you know across the country will meet up. I think there's an event at Chepstow uh, where they meet up once a year, and it's, it's a sight to behold. You know, we, when you've got a, these dozens of Mary Lloyds walking down, mm. parading down the street together, and they go elsewhere around the country as well. So, for you personally, you traveled to all of these locations, you spent over a year examining the mythology of various areas of South Wales and North Wales. Tell me, what did you find personally to be the most interesting and why? Yeah, gosh, I knew, you know, I, I got a few interviews lined up. I, I know mm-hmm. this question's coming, but it's, uh, it's the most difficult question ever, I think, for someone with an interest in folklore. You know, how mm-hmm. do you choose your favourite? Sure. Um, so I've been pondering this for a while, and I must say, you know, in terms of locations, it's very hard to pinpoint one location. But I must say, if you consider the map in Ogion, and, you know, because there's numerous locations all over Wales, and many of these tales spanned, you know, across Wales. You'd have characters travelling across the country to you know, meet meet up with other characters and, you know, wage war with other mm-hmm. princes and what have you. Uh, what I find, you know, fascinating is when you when you do travel around Wales, the name, many names of mountains and woodlands and what have you, so many of them have got their names from the Mabinogion. And mm-hmm. I find it so fascinating. So these the Mabinogion were written, well, they see, you know, again, you see written, you know, it, hundreds of years ago but mm-hmm. they existed as you know oral tradition for hundreds of years before that um and it's i think it's so fascinating how actual history and history that's become lost to people because people didn't write down what happened because right. you know so, so these historical events over time have evolved into myths and legends and you know, it'll give you one example. You know, there's a one in one of the tales. There's a, a Welsh, a giant, a Welsh giant, who leads the Welsh on a war against the Irish. And over in Ireland, there's a river, and he has to he you know the 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 Welsh soldiers can't cross, so the giant leans over it, and the men crawl over his back, mm-hmm. and I can't actually recall the 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 Gaelic name for Dublin, but I believe it translates to the town of Hurdles. And because he placed Hurdles on his back for his ah, men to cross. Okay. Uh, so I find, you know, of, of course, there never was a giant. But mm-hmm. you do wonder what events did take place then sure. for these connections, not just in you know, place names in Wales, but it extends over to Ireland and other countries as well. You know, so mm-hmm. and K- King Arthur features a lot in the tales, you know, and, and there's a lot of speculation there with, you know, could there have been a King Arthur who, you know, of course, you know, he probably didn't have Excalibur and, you know, he didn't certainly didn't mm-hmm. fight dragons and what have you. But, you know, he features in so many 
tales, not just Welsh tales, but Cornish tales as well. And you do yes. wonder what truth is there to, to these old myths, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and also what fascinates me, the characters themselves, they're very human. So I remember when I read uh, Joseph Campbell's A Hero with a Thousand Faces. And one of the things uh, Joseph Campbell suggests is that these heroes, they're not these, you know, knights in shining armor that, that people associate with heroes, but they represent us and the daily battles of a, of a you know, the your average human. And the... The fact that not every human is a knight in shining armor. We all have flaws, you know, in our personalities. And, you know, when you read the Mavin Ogion, you know, even King Arthur and and his men, you know, it it was very, you know, he did some very, you know, could be very cruel. And he, you know, did some things today where people certainly wouldn't refer to him as a hero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's right. not just King Arthur. So a lot of these figures in the Mabinogion, you know, you 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 really you do often ponder: are they heroes or are they villains? And ultimately, they're human, and that's what I love about them. And again, going back to the you know the Victorians, it wasn't really until Victorian times that people started reimagining a lot of these figures as knights in shining armor, and and you do wonder then with. Did they then perceive them as, you know, the heroes we all strive to be? You know, so, yeah, I do find it all very fascinating. But on a quick side note, I also yes. find it, found it fascinating, you know, learning when stories from other countries came over. So a great example, Beth Gellert, where I worked, you know, it's, it's not too far from Canarvon. And are you familiar with Beth Gellert and the legend with the, the dog and the wolf? Yes, I have heard of it. Yeah, um, a lot, I don't a lot, know a lot the, one of the detail. Yeah, so uh, you know, very very long story short, about a a prince who blames his dog for the death of his son and kills the dog, only to realize that the dog was in fact the savior and that he protected his son from the wolf. And you know, you, you growing up in North Wales, mm-hmm. you you kind of associate that as very much being a Welsh tale. But as soon as I started writing the blog and, you know, read the going down that folklore rabbit hole, I mentioned, right. uh-huh. and you realize, gosh, you know, this story pops up in countries all over the world. Uh, and very often, you know, the animal changes, you know, depending what country it is. And mm-hmm. I believe one of the earliest examples originated in India. Uh, and it was a story about a, a pet mongoose protected his family from a, a cobra. Mm. You know, so and the, so it's so fascinating how these stories, you know, we humans travel, of course, we always sure. have, and these right. tales travel with us and they evolve and adapt to suit new cultures. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, Greg. <laughs> In a long shot, I can't narrow it down, I must say. I know it's a difficult question and it's like asking someone who they're, you know, favorite child is uh, yes. <laughs> a very difficult thing to answer. So, Russ, are there any final comments uh, you would like to make as we conclude the interview today? Uh, yes, what I do uh, like to encourage people is if you have got an interest in folklore and mythology is to get out there to see these places while you still can. Because what one of the biggest things I realized when writing my book, you know, so many of these sites are under threat and they mm-hmm. won't be be here forever. And it's for various reasons. Sites near the coast, you know, you've got a, a erosion or what have you. Sea levels are rising, and nice. many, you know, hill forts that are near the coast in Wales probably won't be here in fifty years' time. And then you've got other sites that disappear due to industrialization. There was, you know, there was one site. Uh, it's just a small tale about a, a man who marries, a, you know, a, a fairy. He has a fairy mm-hmm. wife, uh, and the, you know, the the family it was a real family. You know, the, his descendants are still there today, but the farm, the cottage, you know, that where the story took place, it's been knocked down, and they've not they've built a car park over it. No. 
you know, yes, it's you know such a tragedy. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know. So I do tell and try like to encourage people get out there while you still can if you have got an interest. Great. Well, thank you for that. Now, if someone would like to contact you about the book, where can they send an email and what websites are available to purchase the book or maybe to contact you or read more that you're writing about on the internet? Yes, well, I do have my own. So my author email, if people would mm -hmm. like to contact. So you, it's all in lowercase. You've got Welsh Indie, so W E L. S H I N D I E mm -hmm. at russwilliams.org. So you're more than welcome to email me. Uh, but if you would like to order, uh, pre order the book now, I, I would go on to www.uwp, which stands for uh, University of Wales Press, mm -hmm. uh, .co.uk. So that's uwp uk and do a forward slash where the folk and i'm sure it'll come up but as of 19th of september of course it's going mm -hmm. to be it's going to be available on the the high streets all the high street shops and local bookshops and museums you know in, in wales and other parts of the uk and i'm sure it'll be you'll be able to find me on amazon by that point you mentioned right. amazon earlier so yeah we have been talking to russ about his book, Where the Folk. And he is very proud of it, and he has a reason to be, because it's a very interesting read, and I strongly recommend you get yourself a copy and enjoy learning more about wealth myth mythology. So, Russ, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you being part of the Welsh American Channel. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Ple pleasure's all mine. All right, everyone, thank you. Hoyland Nauer. Bye. Bye for now. <laughs>